This is the Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. So probably the biggest topic in the business world today in investing world is AI. And there's a lot of controversy over AI. Elon Musk is very concerned about controlling AI. Um, Congress is looking at regulating AI, um, which is challenging since they can't even regulate cryptocurrency. And um, the question is, is AI going to hurt us or is it going to help us? Is it going to, is, is Siri going to kill us? Or is Siri, is Siri um, the, the, uh, a, a solution and a, and a step forward? And I love the positive side of looking at technology and what it can do for us. And we have the expert, um, Russ Newman, who's the uh, professor of media technology. Make sure I get this right. Media technology at NYU. Um, and uh, just so excited to have you on our show today, um, Russ, because uh, we were, as we were talking earlier, um, AI actually plays a, is going to play a big role in the tax field and a big role in business. So um, if you could just give us a little of your background, because you've, um, you, you've spent some time um, uh, watching this whole thing evolve and would love to get some of your perspectives. Okay, I have a PhD in the social sciences and sociology from UC Berkeley. But I spent most of my career at, uh, at MIT, at the MIT Media Lab. And I've been co-teaching with engineers now for the last uh, 20 years. And as a result, uh, after I've been at uh, Penn, Michigan, and now at NYU, um, I, I become the, the technology guy. And so my focus is on not just how the technology works, so I think it's important that we understand that. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about the how the, the guts of these AI systems uh, are designed. Um, it's what's the social impact, social, economic, cultural impact of these technologies. So that's my specialty. I love that. So let, let, let's start with some of the basics. So um, if you would, tell us what, just real briefly, what is AI and what isn't AI? Okay. Um, the term... <laughs> Got invented in the mid 1950s uh, in, in a hopeful in a hopeful mood, and the, over the last 70 years, there's been uh, AI winters, uh, 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 periods when we felt we'll never get it all to work. And people's perspective on all this has changed in the last year as a result of uh, uh, GPT 3.5.4 and Chat GPT. Uh, and it turns out that uh, a number of the major players, including uh, Google uh, and others uh, uh, and, and Meta, were sitting on very large language model um, and felt pressed to, <clears throat> to move forward when uh, ChatGPT caused all that trouble. Um, artificial intelligence basically refers, refers to a decision system that's following a set of rules. And if you think, I, I have a way of trying to humanize something that's very hard to understand. If you think about when you're typing in your 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 cell phone uh, or your computer, finishes the sentences, I'd like to meet you at eight, and it goes o'clock uh, tonight. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> when, when there's a set of rules, uh, and it turns out that finishing a sentence is fairly easy because most of the kinds of things we're typing with our, th our, our thumbs uh, have very predictable sentence structure. And so finish the spelling and finish the sentence is very easy. What happened was they started extending the length of the prediction so that if you start a sentence and now not only finish the sentence, but finish the paragraph and finish the entire essay. And to do that, they had to make a much, much larger model. Now, if I said how to finish your sentence, maybe it has 10 words that it thinks are likely and it picks the most likely word out of 10. The number of parameters in these modern models is uh, in the neighborhood of 100 billion different parameters. Mm -hmm. And that's why when they put these large systems to work, they can't predict which of the billions that could possibly be activated by a particular prompt are going to be activated. So if you think about the human brain, there are 90 billion roughly uh, neurons uh, in the uh, human brain. So we're, we've got... Um, models estimating the future uh, and trying to predict it and understanding the past based on an experience of uh, reading 
trillions of texts from mostly from the internet um, that generate uh, predictions uh, about the future, which we take to be almost human-like in their uh, prescience. Interesting. So uh, you're, you're, you're very much a proponent, uh, as I understand it, of AI and the positive effects on how we make decisions with that, that how AI might help us make decisions. Can you kind of walk us through that? Because there's so much fear. Uh, you know, I know you wrote, it, it is your quote I started with, uh, is Siri going to kill us? And, and so, um, you know, let's let's move it to the positive side. I mean, I wrote a book called Tax-Free Wealth, which is the positive side of tax. So how do you take the positive side of AI and how will it affect our decision-making process? Okay, let me start by trying to be respectful and say certainly you want to be cautious and careful. And the senior executives and engineers that are working in this area have expressed concerns and cautions. Many of my colleagues at MIT have joined the, have become a, signers to that document said maybe we should pause for six months. I think they knew it was unlikely that that was actually going to happen. But by making something as concrete as saying maybe we should wait six months and see if we've got this all together and have uh, dealt with the risks of misalignment between what these systems are doing and what we want them to do. So I'm respectful of those concerns. But I think they're based on a fundamental misconception, which is to protect, to project human values and experience and uh, humans were evolved from competition for scarce resources. That's not how these systems were set up. So the notion that they're going to want to kill all of us in order to take the resources we have is kind of a classic anthropomorphic projection onto these systems. Uh, the classic question worth paying attention to is if they get really smart, how can we protect ourselves if they are sort of, quote, smarter than we are? And the answer is we uh, exploit AI systems on our own side and have them inspect and make sure that these complicated systems, only another AI system could probably monitor a working AI system. So we can put the AI systems under our control to protect us. Using AI to monitor it, to, to monitor other AI. I, I, because like you say, it's a, it is a computer. It's not a person. And, and so, you know, we can't, we're actually telling it what to do in the first place. Is that fair? And uh, uh, we can, you know, and, and so that does make some sense. When you talk about um, decision-making, so how do you see AI in the decision-making process? I, I think that's very important. Our audience is primarily entrepreneurs and investors. Um, how do you see AI helping us in that decision-making process? Okay, um, if you think about what Consumer Reports does, it tries to figure out the quality of different products. And it's got maybe, I don't know, 10 different dimensions of uh, a outdoor uh, grill. And one of them is the price and the shininess and the how fast it heats up. And what happens is they sort of figure out what they think is the most important. And they say, well, then we recommend this particular grill to you. What these systems are getting more and more responsive to is your own particular interests. And getting a shiny grill and one that starts up real fast isn't of your concern. So it, it weights the different values. So here's where uh, AI systems, when they're practically accessible, and part of my book uh, it, it tries to address this question of how, how will we communicate? And I, I start out with the notion of a little uh, a little a, a, a Siri character sitting on your shoulder, watching the world as you watch it, and then but and whispering into your ear. Uh, the issue there is that computers. You said it's just a computer, but these computers are getting closer and closer to us. They used to be big rooms, then they were on our desktop, right. then laptop, then in our palm, and it's pretty soon they're going to be in our glasses and in wearables, and ultimately, I think, in contact lenses, where we're communicating with a big system. It's not. It's not a box anymore, it's a network. And we'll be right. able to access the network through all kinds of uh, uh, audio, visual, tactile, and uh, ultimately direct to brain connections. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, all right, you gotta make a decision here. Here are five considerations. You tell me which ones are most important and let's walk through that. <clears throat> so it helps to clarify our values, uh, our, our the outcomes we desire the most. Uh, and then it, instead of telling us what to do, it helps us mm -hmm evaluate the options. So so are you suggesting it'll help us ask better questions? Uh, you put it very well. Um, because I, I I have long believed that the the number one role of an advisor 
is to ask better questions. And the better questions we ask, for example, in my business, uh, the question I get asked all the time is, is something deductible, right? Is this mug deductible? And uh, I said, well, a better question would be, how do I make this mug deductible? And so it sounds like to me that what AI can do is kind of search the universe, basically of questions and come up with, well, here's some better questions to ask. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? It is indeed. So, okay. So let's, let's take this into the financial world, um, free markets, et cetera, but let's, let's, let's stick with actual re, um, real, um, in other words, day-to-day -day stuff. Okay. So we're trying to make a decision on an investment in a multifamily housing syndication. Okay. So this is, this is a developer that's bought a two, is buying a 200 unit apartment complex. Um, just so I can, just, just so we can get a little concrete here. Uh, but, uh, and we're trying to do our due diligence on it. How do you think that uh, AI might help us with our due diligence? Well, if you, I'm going to go back to that question and say, well, it's only a computer and, and say, well, think of it not as a computer, but part of a very elaborate system. So basically, uh, the classic measure of, of assessing uh, value is comparables. So uh, typically, we can hold two or three comparables in our head. Um, AI systems can hold a thousand comparables in their head and weight the difference and try different senses of which dimensions of comparability would be the best. And instead of giving you a recommendation, say here are five or 10 different scenarios of how the value of this would succeed and whether the chances of a second wave of COVID would influence the, uh, the investment and would give a very nuanced and, uh, and, and describe the conditionalities that the investor might want to consider in making the investment. And interesting. So let's go to a let's now let's expand to a little more global viewpoint. We had the um, uh, right now we've got the Federal Reserve uh, trying to combat inflation with uh, interest rates, which I I, I think they have got it wrong. But um, let, let's say that you're the Federal Reserve chairman and or you're the Federal Reserve. How would you use AI? to predict because it's got some predictive abilities, right? Because it's looking at history. It's looking at consequences. It's looked at what's happened in the past. Um, how would you, uh, how would you go about using AI to predict what might happen with an, with another interest rate rise, for example? Well, but now we're in the domain of macroeconomics and these fellows have been doing modeling and estimating for, for years. So uh, They've got, I don't know if you want to call it AI or not, they've got very complicated models and they can work the different conditionals to see how that affects the model. So my guess is um, that community is already uh, working uh, with very complicated multivariate models to, to make those predictions. So in that case, I think it would be nothing new. The idea that something is complicated as a staff of 20 quants working for a particular investment uh, a firm or for the Fed um, becomes something that the average individual and the average investor can put to work. Oh, I like that idea. I like that idea. I, I, I'd love to take Wall Street out of it. Um, so, <laughs> so, so speaking of that, so I had did an interview um, uh, not too long ago with uh, a fellow by the name of Alex Tapscott, and he was talking about Web 3.0 and blockchain. And uh, he's, course, always, he's always talking about blockchain. He is, and 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 block and and, and, and blockchain I love is Top Scott's middle name is blockchain. I, I think so. But fun to hear him talk. I gotta say, I I love blockchain because it's really when it, when you break it down, it's triple entry accounting. So it's just an accounting system, is what blockchain uh, really ends up being. Um, how do you see? And and he's talking about Web three and how blockchain. You know that it, it'll be the 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 internet of ownership. And how do you see AI and blockchain? This is a question I've had for the last couple of years. How will AI and blockchain work together? Uh, I'm going to give an answer that you rarely get in this kind of a context, which is, I don't know. <laughs> Everybody else seems to have an opinion on these. Uh, my perception is that the advantages and weaknesses of uh, blockchain uh, 
data storage and verification technologies are quite independent from the kind of decision processing uh, strengths that, that AI has. So if anything, uh, I think the two are complementary and that uh, AI, that I don't think there's any uh, technical or architectural requirement that a blockchain model would be needed for an AI system to be very successful well, and vice versa. One one of the concerns, and, and this is actually one of Alex's, what one of the things he mentioned as a concern is that um, if you if you if you start with an incorrect assumption in blockchain, it just perpetuates itself forever because you, you it, you've got you gotta be right in the first place. And so my question is, how will um because because in that you know, now it's distributed, right? It's not at a central location, it's distributed out there, it's auditing itself. And so how will you, um, so will AI, I, what I'm wondering is, um, you know, one of the things I've noticed with these AI note takers is I, I, I get the notes back and I'm going, that's not what I said. You know, I, I'm just going, I'm sorry, I, I don't like them because I'm going, they actually misstate what I said in the conversation. And I'm going, so they actually, to me, create an inaccuracy. And then we assume it's correct. It's like, remember when the internet first came out, we said, well, if it's on the web, it must be true. Right. And, and now it's like, well, if it's AI, it must, must be right. I mean, look at, look at all of this, uh, you know, computer, uh, you compability and, and the uh, ability for it to do this. So how do you, how do you look at this from an, because to me, a lot of it's an accuracy issue, right? Will it be accurate? Um, or is it just taking, could it just be taking a lot of inaccurate things and combining them together to create something else that's inaccurate? Okay, I, I want to respond to two elements of, of your uh, query. Uh, the first is the notion that a blockchain will multiply inaccuracies. My sense is that what blockchains are good at is correcting inaccuracies. So if I have uh, uh, a certain uh, value of cryptocurrency and that's been documented in the blockchain, and somebody else wants to steal my investment and, and writes in one element of the blockchain that it belongs to him instead of me, then the, all the others vote and it says, well, that's only one vote and there's 30, 50 right. other records out there that corrects it. So the blockchain is is uh, is a good model for correcting by- right. but, but, but let's say yeah. let's say that you didn't own it in the first place, but in the blockchain, you owned it. That, that's, that's where you got a problem. Because the, 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 so here's the, so here's the example I used. I, cause I'm asking him because to me, uh, one of the most obvious uses for blockchain is title, uh, is, is actually recording title on property. And, you know, let's get rid of these title companies who get to charge over and over and over for really doing nothing, but, uh, what they've done once and they get to, to charge for it a hundred times. Um, every time you refinance your house, you get a, a, a title, you know, you get a title insurance charge, which makes no sense to me. So, and, and his, his point, his, his comment was, if I'm understanding it right, was, well, yes, but you have to, you do have to make sure that that was right in the first place, because if you put it out in the blockchain, it's like there and it's not coming back. So that's, I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, accuracy issue we're talking about. And with AI, where AI is really looking at a, you know, the, you know, the entire universe here, if we will, um, or the universe of what it has access to, right? Um, will it, will it find those inaccuracies? Will AI actually be a tool to find the inaccuracies? Uh, well, you can predict, uh, given my generally positive and hopeful view of AI that yeah, I think they will will get a lot better. So Tom, when you get concerned about AI making mistakes, first you want to use the cute word that we've invented, calling them hallucinations. Uh, ah. Makes it a little a little less uh, threatening when you say, well, it has little hallucinations. <laughs> and the second thing is to say, this is a toddler AI. We're, we're, we're talking about the Model uh, T mm -hmm. here. It, we, For sure. You know, run around in front and crank the engine, then come back and put the spark back so that it works. Uh, and put goggles on because we don't have windshields that are very good yet. So this is the Model T of, of AI. And the capacity for self-correction is, is very strong. And uh, I think uh, I, I would be surprised if the first uh, first editions of AI didn't hallucinate a little bit. But of I think course. you'll see increasing um, uh, levels of accuracy. And if you think about um, 
Well, take Wikipedia, for example. Uh, they mm -hmm. did. It, it, here's anybody can write anything they want in Wikipedia, pretty much. But they've got a self-monitoring system that works there. And uh, studies have said that the accuracy of, of Wikipedia is about equivalent, if some, and often better than a traditional encyclopedia with all the author authorities writing the articles, like Britannica. That's interesting. So, um, all right. So, I'm going to ask you the, the 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 question that we started with: Should AI be regulated, or can it be regulated? Uh, no and no. Uh, I understand the impulse uh, that for something that is that looks very powerful and uh, looks like it, it could be a, an issue to be uh, dealt with. And so they don't look like they're behind the times. The uh, uh, members of Congress announced that they're monitoring these things closely and examining what's going on and interviewing all the senior engineers and uh, executives and and. Uh, and NGO folks that are concerned about possible bad effects. Um, my argument is that um, AI is basically math, applied math, and you can't regulate math. My argument is most of what AI does is to speak, and prior restraint of speech is something that I think is not a promising way to move. Um, and third, I said the concerns that motivate uh, interest in generating the, a federal artificial intelligence commission. By the way, if you do that acronym, it comes out pronounced fake. Ah, um, uh, I like that, it. <laughs> that what you're going to confront is, uh, well, if somebody has used AI to commit a crime, to rob a bank, or used AI to violate someone's privacy or uh, used AI to libel someone, we already have laws in each of those three areas. So my term of art for uh, approach to regulation is to say, regulate downstream. Uh, if you, you, don't you don't arrest the car company that created the car that was used by the bank robber, you, you, you go after the crime and the perpetrator, not the tools that were used. I like that. Uh, okay, so I wanna, I wanna turn to, um... Speaking of regulating or using AI, uh, and where I have a concern is this is where AI is, the IRS has announced recently that AI will be used to catch people who are uh, supposedly underpaying tax, and they will go after them. Um, what's your view of that? Do you have, do you have a view of that? Um the the issue with AI is that it can say, here are a couple of, by studying when a documented uh, um, false filing with the IRS, documented that it was in fact in, incorrect and illegal and, and wrong. Uh, and we say, what are the other traits of that filer that would might be a cue that we should say, we need to pay attention to these sorts of people. That's something, as you know well, the IRS has been doing uh, all along. It's been looking right. for patterns of uh, associated so that they can use some other cues and say, let's pay a little bit more attention to this subgroup of filers uh, that are more likely um, and, and have more options for misrepresenting their uh, income. So I think it's just, uh, it's, it's so I think it's not fundamentally new. It's applying a set of uh, principles. And uh, obviously, I'd be concerned if the IRS, uh, you know, <laughs> threw you in jail or or uh, generated all kinds of problems based on on some attributes you have, without actually having documented that some uh, some element of of your filing uh, was demonstrably incorrect and illegal. So, so, so if I'm understanding you, um, identifying people to audit not a problem. Assessing people without auditing them would be a problem. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, and as a red-blooded American, the fewer people they audit, the better. <laughs> well, uh, you know, here's, uh, here's, here's some of the challenges. Of course, what they're trying to do is they want to match up, right? And so from that standpoint, if they can do more matching and better matching and the computers can help them do that. So, for example, uh, right now, if you get a 1099 and you don't report that, you know, exactly the same on your tax return, 
uh, the, the, the IRS is going to match that. What they can't do right now is match like a K-1 from your business or from your investment. They can't match that up. But presumably then with the new technology, they might be able to do that. That That's kind of the idea behind it. The concern, of course, is that um, the IRS has a newfound propensity to say, we don't like something and therefore we are going to disallow it, even whether it's legal or not. And then you have to support it in court, which could cost you a million dollars, uh, which basically is the ultimate hammer, sledgehammer, right? And so that's the kind, I, I think when, when I look at the potential for, um, and I, I'm not even gonna call it abuse, although, a lot of people would call it abuse, but the, the potential for using this for really nefarious purposes. Um, do you think that that is real? Um, or do you think that somehow it will self-regulate? All right, Tom, uh, I, I, when you were talking about IRS is trying to find when an audit is justified or not, if we can encourage the IRS to use uh, cautiously, carefully, thoughtfully, uh, new uh, decision systems to prevent false positives. That's when you mentioned the, your 1099, but there was some error in, in the IRS's version of the same 1099 that you got. You, you, you were doing everything you were supposed to, and they said, no, 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 we want to drag you into an audit because it's there was a slightly different uh, identification number somewhere on the 1099. Right. Yeah. So if they can fix that problem, that would be great. That's solving against false positives. Now, Tom, you and I are going to think of a really good idea, and then you're going to carry it to the IRS. And here's our new idea. Are you ready? I love it. Um, what the IRS does is it says, we're going to pursue this hammer, and we're going to take this to court because we're going to disallow it because we don't like it. Because, well, let's see, what's our primary motivation as the IRS? Ah, it's increasing income to the government. Right. What we can, what our idea is, Tom and Russ come up with this idea that they should have another thing, which is the cost of uh, the harassment cost, the burden to the typical taxpayer that's generated by that same decision or audit uh, uh, system and say, we want to both maximize income to the government, fair enough, and minimize the unnecessary hassle paperwork, et cetera, that is uh, incurred upon both business and individual filers. So if we can come up with and uh, find a, a real good consultancy that can work with the IRS with its extra resources for hiring consultants now, uh, let's come up with a second measure of uh, inconvenience, harassment, uh, difficulty, and cost, legal uh, 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 data processing costs to the individual filer and see if they can then measure a ratio of possible benefit for increased income to the government and uh, love that against the cost of the hassle to the individual taxpayer. I, I, I love that because the, you know, the definition of tax and we'll wrap up pretty quick here, but the definition of tax is a drag, right? You're taxing something. So you're putting a drag on it. And so if you tax more of something, you actually get less of it. Um, because you're putting a you're putting a burden on it, and so I think that those models would be great if if we started using those models to say, okay, what tax actually works? What actually tax? You know, if you're talking about, for example, income inequality, well, what tax works to help with income inequality? Is it the income tax, or would we better be better off with an estate tax or with a consumption a, a, a different kind of consumption tax, a value added tax? I think that is a very positive view, and I love, I love where you're going with that, uh, Russ. I'm all in. I'm all in. We'll we, absolutely. We 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 need to put this together. We'll start with the Office of Management and Budget because they might listen a little um, earlier than the IRS might. But I think it's I think it's terrific to see the positives of this. The the only thing that's missing is uh, my book, Evolutionary Intelligence, which should be there on that bookshelf behind you with all those other books prominently. Uh, I, I I absolutely. Well, it will be soon. Absolutely. I, I like that. I, I'm, I'm in agreement there. I, I totally love it. So again, the book is Evolutionary Intelligence, How Technology Will Make Us Smarter. Um, it's absolutely been uh, terrific uh, having this conversation with you, Russ. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love the positive aspect of what you're saying. And that, look, we may, we may see some negatives, but 
then let's do the positive side. So if there is a negative, let's say the IRS does something we find negative, well, let's find a way to help them make it positive. And I, I, I love that idea. I know that when we do that, uh, we'll always make way more money and pay way less tax. Thanks for us. You've been listening to The Wealth Ability Show with Tom Wheelwright. Way more money, way less taxes. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.